This is David Bose. I am the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center, and welcome to another episode of Washington Policy on the Go. Today, we're going to be talking with our Center Director, uh, Center for Healthcare Director, Elizabeth Hovde. Uh, we'll also talk with Pam Lewison, our Initiative on Agriculture Director, and then we'll speak with Mark Harmsworth, our Center for Small Business Director as well. Um, but first, I wanted to remind you that we had some great news this week. Todd Myers, our Center for the Environment Director, um, his brand new book, uh, Think Small, is uh, going to be out this fall, and uh, the pre-orders uh, are available right now. So we have some information about his new book coming up. It's about environmental solutions that go outside of government and are actually achieving um, they're making greater progress through new technology and individual action than most government promises. Uh, we had a couple of releases on that this, this week, uh, or last week rather, um, in conjunction with Earth Day. And then, of course, we saw Earth Day come and go, and you saw politicians um, you know, the, at the federal level with President Biden's visit here in Washington State, very focused on making a public appearance, talking about forests, even though if you zoom in on the photograph, there's, you know, there's um, a parking lot right behind the, the trees in the backdrop. So they got the headlines, but they didn't actually make great policy. And Todd has exposed some of uh, the poor policies that have been championed uh, by Governor Inslee and by the Biden administration. In some cases, like the Biden administration, um, the preferences for uh, policy dollars to go to establish political friends uh, more than those policy dollars going to actual environmental achievement. And the Inslee administration uh, kind of doubled down on that by cheering that Build Back Better approach uh, on. And then Todd also exposed the uh, poor track record of the governor, and to be fair to the governor, to most, uh, most alarmists, uh, the poor track record that the governor had in his book, Apollo's Fire, um, it was mostly Apollo's misfire. And Todd lists a number of ways, the number of predictions that the governor made where he was saying things like, this is what we need to invest in. This is where the future is. And that uh, is just not the case. It didn't, didn't come true. And Todd explains it you know, uh, very well. These are, are very complicated uh, issues. And it's better if we don't have a top-down government approach where government's making the decisions for us um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, um, the government is a poor predictor of technology, a poor predictor of, of what the future holds. Um, you know, by definition, we know as free market fans, when you've got this centralized planning, uh, <laughs> they can't plan fast enough because they're no match for the invisible hand and the information that comes from the marketplace. All right, let's turn to uh, today's, um, uh, today's center directors uh, for the program. Uh, let's start with Elizabeth. Um, you other two can shut off your video for now, and we'll get to you during the Q&A section. I do want to remind everybody, we do try and take questions uh, toward the end. We try to get to every question that we get. You have a toolbox in your Zoom, uh, usually at the bottom of it or on the uh, right-hand side of your screen. Uh, there's a Q&A section where you can take your, um, you can type in your question at any point, and we'll, uh, we'll get to that toward the end of the, of the program. All right, Elizabeth, a long-term care plan. I feel like we've been talking about this for quite some time, uh, but it just keeps- And we, uh, and keeps... we got 18 more months this <laughs> last session. We're going to be talking about it forever. Oh, well, I don't feel as bad talking about it now because at least I'm not paying for it right now. They're just getting ready to charge me for it right now. So uh, that's a little better. I know some are saying, why didn't you opt out? Hey, I didn't have time. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> I, I now, tried a couple of times and didn't make it. So. And now the people who opted out are wondering, ah, I would have had 18 more months if I didn't opt out. <laughs> right, but still, yeah, I, I've come across a few. I, you know, for, for my purposes, um, I know that I've come across a couple of people who said, I, I would have, you know, I don't, I don't want to pay, you know, forever on this long-term care plan that I want. They kind of were going for the, I want to buy something and then, escape it later approach. But I actually thought the one positive thing that this, uh, that this legislation did was remind people that, hey, you've got pretty significant odds that you're going to need some long-term care. Getting insurance for that is not necessarily a bad thing. Exactly. So, you know, um, that's, the, that's what I've been saying this whole time. That's the silver lining of all of this, that we're actually having a conversation we need to have. This is a green population. It's a problem. We need to figure it out. 70% of us will likely need some form of long-term care. 
Yeah. And so we also have some new exemptions that, um, you know, for people who weren't going to benefit necessarily from the program, we have some new uh, exemptions available. Why don't you describe those for us? So an exemption was given in House Bill 1733 to military spouses, non-immigrant visa holders, uh, military that had a 70% or higher service-connected disability, and out-of-state residents who work here. So that is going to be um, something where those people in those categories can apply after January 1st or on January 1st of 2023. So um, well, I recently wrote about this and it's interesting because all the literature you read about it and the law, it says they can opt out. They're able to opt out. It doesn't use the word opt out. They talk about exemptions. But um, I think that's gonna be part of the trick. I don't think a lot of these groups are instantly aware. They're not automatically exempt. They're going to have to apply in the process just as private long-term care insurance holders had to apply last year. Yeah, it seems like there's a little trick of the language going on here, because when I hear exempt, I think, okay, that does not apply to me. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm exempt from that. I don't have to worry about it. Yep. And so it would be very easy for me if I was told I was exempt to just dismiss the whole thing. and I wouldn't listen to anything else about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, I, that's why I wrote a piece last week about this, because I've talked to at least five people in the last month who said, oh yeah, I'm exempt now. And I think, oh no, 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 you're not really exempt, exempt. I actually had to look up the word and five different dictionaries to make sure I wasn't being silly, but you're, you know, an exemption means something we all think, and it doesn't in this sense. You need to apply to be exempt. Uh oh, you're not on. There was, um... There's some construction. I, I, there was a windstorm a, a little while back during our last episode. I described this, but um, and so there's been some roof damage that they're still repairing right now. So if you hear wow. that in the background, that thundering is not not bad weather. It's just hammers. We'll take um, you and your construction. It's all good. <laughs> there you go. So um, what if what's the process for exempting? And is it a one-time thing for the for people for the new people who are exempt, or is this something that they're going to have to re-up on, like others have done? And is there a category of person that was missed that's still not going to benefit? Yes, and yes, the the Employment Security Department is working rules around the process for exemption. So I can't say for sure what that's going to look like today. What it looked like for people who had private long-term care insurance plans was that they signed on to a website, they proved who they were, and then they attested to the fact that they had long-term care insurance. And to me, it didn't look like any verification was going on whatsoever. In any case, that exemption is shut down now. That was a one-time only get out of jail free card. And this new exemption category will have rules written for it. I'm not sure what they'll look like. Um, lastly, you asked about any exemption, any exemption category that isn't included, and they still haven't figure out it, figured out a way to accommodate people who move out of our state, even if they're vested in this fund. Uh, as most people know, this is a tax that occurs all of your working years, all of them. And even if you pay in for 20, 30 years, if you move out of the state after your retirement and need long-term care and apply, you will not be um, qualified because you moved out of the state. So well, they still have not figured that out. And I don't expect them to, even though they hope to. What if you moved out of the state, you needed long-term care, so you moved back in? Would, would you get the benefit thinking, again? I would think if you are vested, yes, that would be possible. So you'd kind of you'd have a lot of moving yes. at a very at a very unfortunate time in life. You'd you'd, be, you'd have to be moving around quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and then what about people who uh, people who don't quite get the full ten years in? Are they exempt then? They're out of luck. So okay. they're they're they've paid in and given their money to this program. They will not be able to qualify for the benefit. So we have almost 500. I'm sorry. In most cases, there is a provision that allows for temporary vestment 
and it's a little more complicated, but let's say you, um, you got hit by a car and you needed long-term care and you applied for this fund and you had paid in the last, for three of the last six years, you would, it's complicated, but there is a provision for things like that. So we had almost 500,000 people um, sign out of this thing. And that was, you know, uh, I mean, it's not like there was an organized marketing campaign warning people about the tax. It was Washington Policy Center, your work, you know, some op-eds and, and then word of mouth. And, and that list was growing. I mean, it wasn't slowing down. The demand was so hot that they couldn't, they couldn't get out of it fast enough. They couldn't find a plan to purchase uh, because of the distortion of the private sector plan. Um, and yet now there's a new marketing, there's a marketing campaign that you wrote about, an expensive one that they're, the state's launching to kind of sell this, this, uh, this lemon <laughs> to, to people. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I think that's kind of interesting where they're, they're, the plan does not exist yet, but they're already spending money trying to get you to like it, even though it's mandatory. So it's not like you have a choice in the matter. So the, the purpose of a marketing plan is what? I mean, if you're forced into it anyway... I, I think this, I this this renewed marketing plan to try yeah. to get you to washing to like the Washington Care Funds. I think is really centered around those new exemption categories. They want to make sure you know that it's something you should like, that it's better than private long term care. So they say. I don't agree with that. Um, and they are trying to make sure you don't opt out even though you are in an exemption category, because if you do, you will never be able to, you will lose the benefit. So I believe that is what the marketing campaigns will center around is keeping people in the program. And they've also, the whole uh, time they've been talking about this um, for not quite a year, but um, they've been trying to make sure that there's, they, they call it creating an affinity for the fund, which means creating affection for the fund and making sure um, that they can put their two cents forward about why it's better than other avenues to long-term care funding. Well, I mean, for one thing, they've driven the private market out. So there is no other avenue for long-term care, you know, other than your own, you know, selling assets or other things that you might have, have created for yourself in order to provide for yourself in the future. So there's no, no competition. And yet there's this compulsion to spend a lot of money on a major marketing campaign to keep people in something that's mandatory anyway. I mean, I would think if you want your two cents, just tell the call center, you know, that's taking the calls to exempt people if they want that, say, all right. Before you do this, I want you aware of these five things. Do you still want right. to go forward? I get that all the time. I, you know, for every, uh, tell them to call any newspaper company and they'll tell you what to say. You know, right. would, would you like to keep this benefit if we Are only you charged sure? you? <laughs> and it is carefully listed on their website yeah. what happens if you exempt yourself from this. Because right now there's still an exemption window open for the people who do have private long-term care if they haven't applied yet. But that um, exemption application process has slowed to a trickle. But it, like I said, it's almost 500,000 and I'm sure it'll reach that before um, it ends on December 31st, 1st. Extra. So what's the ideal here? I mean, right now, people, this is the difficult part because people, I, I think people forget what was possible. You know, once they're, they're used to a system, it's like going to Oregon and discovering that people don't pump their own gas. And then you talk to people at the pump who are really adamant about this idea. It's super dangerous. You know, you don't want to do that without training for yourself. It's like, hey, there's 49 other states. Everybody else is pumping their own gas. They've been doing it since they were 15 and had their driver's permit you've been misled, sir. You've been misled. Yeah. I feel like um, in the long-term care department, we're going to get to a point where people are wondering what else is possible, but they won't know it because, you know, the, the private industry has been driven out. So ideally, what should we look for in this state? What should we look for is we should yeah. look for this law to be repealed so people can have their options back so that there is a full, um, uh, array of products being offered by the insurance market. And some of us don't use insurance at all. Some of us plan for our life needs, one of them being uh, long-term care needs, uh, plan for it in different ways. That's one of the biggest uh, problems with this 
program is that we all have life needs. This is just one of them. And so asking people to save for it in the way the state sees fit, if you don't need long-term care, you just forfeited all, forfeited all that money for another one of your life needs that you might have. So um, there were a, an array of products being offered and I was under the understanding that some of them would come back into the market after the exemption period closed down, which was November 1st for having a plan that qualifies for the state exemption. Um, I haven't caught up on that yet and need to do that. But yeah, I think there are plans coming back in. And for some people, private long-term care insurance is a great idea. And even with the state program that most of the state will be forced to play a part of, a long-term care insurance plan isn't a bad idea. The, the 36,500 will not accommodate most people's long-term care needs. And so whether you're planning for this with a long-term care insurance product or with real estate or with savings or investments, um, there are different ways and financial planners are better able to look at your individual needs. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. We'll get back uh, to you for a Q&A here coming up in a few minutes. Let's turn right. to pa Pam Lewison, our uh, director for, for our initiative on agriculture. Pam, one of the things that caught my eye on your blog was this, um, was lauding Oregon, um, because, you know, Oregon and Washington are frequently compared to one another. Uh, Oregon, you know, uh, Portland and, and Seattle are kind of both um, bellwethers for the state. And, um, and yet all of a sudden I see this headline, uh, Oregon's ag overtime law is just playing better than Washington. What's going on in Oregon and how is it that they're doing uh, things better for agriculture in Oregon than, than is Washington? So it, it pained me to write that Oregon was doing something better than us um, just in general, uh, because my husband is from Oregon and anytime I have to admit that things are better there, it's hard for me. Um, but this legislative session in Oregon, um, that it was a, their turn to um, create an ag overtime law, and they um, they did so. Uh, Kate Brown, I think, uh, two weeks ago now, signed their ag overtime law into effect, um, and it's just it's just better. So um, the Oregon version. Um, phases ag overtime in over the next five years uh, in Washington. It was a three-year phase in beginning this year. Oregon will give it a try starting next year. And they're, they're easing it in a little bit slower in increment than, uh, than we are. Um, and then there are two other provisions in the Oregon law that Washington didn't even consider. The first is that Farmers for this first five years in Oregon will have a tax break. So they'll essentially get most of the overtime that they are paying out to their employees back in the form of what is effectively a tax rebate. And the other is um, that Oregon has tasked all of the state um, departments that will be participating in this uh, ag overtime administration with coming up with an economic impact study. So uh, during this first phase in period, they'll have to do a study to see how it is affecting both the employer and the employees. And then every six years thereafter, they will have to do the same. Um, so at some point they basically left the, the door open to repeal that, um, that ag overtime law in the event that it's not beneficial for the farm workers or for the employers. Have you had any time to think about why uh, Oregon is taking a more um, common sense uh, approach, a more traditional approach with agriculture than is Washington state? Um, because, you know, I mean, roughly speaking, it's, you know, you got the same kind of urban population that drives the policy of the state. I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, activism saying, you know, don't change anything here. Um, you know, so, so what, what's making that difference or have you had ample time to, to consider it? You know, I not covering Oregon's, you know, legislature the same way that I cover ours. 
I have some suspicions. And I think probably the biggest one is, the biggest difference is that, that in Washington, there was a lot of pressure from a very small farm worker um, based lobby organization. And they pushed really hard for a very specific thing. And it was directly driven by the court case that drove dairies into a 40 hour work week situation. Um, <clears throat> so I suspect that we had um, some other outside pressures in Washington that Oregon didn't have. In Oregon, this was a sort of voluntary choice but I also think that Oregon probably observed what was happening in Washington and saw the need to make sure that both parties were at the table from the very beginning to have a reasonable conversation about what overtime should look like. Now that hasn't always been the case in Oregon. There's, there's certainly other instances where reasonable conversation has not been their um, MO particularly when it comes to um, ag legislation. But in this instance, I think there was certainly a pumping of the brakes and saying, okay, we need to get this right the first time to make sure that everyone is represented equally. What do you think? Um, well, one, do you think it's possible that whatever forces there are in Washington state that are adding that pressure, I could see where they might transfer themselves down to Oregon and, and try to force a change there or it might also be that Oregon's approach to this could end up influencing Washington somewhat where people are able to say, hey, look, you know, look at how Oregon is doing this and, you know, versus the way Washington is. Or since both uh, parties, you know, both states end up in the same place, does it ultimately matter? I would love to see Oregon's approach migrate north, to be honest. I think, um, I think our approach to ag overtime is too fast. Um, particularly when you look at the the wholesale uh, three years, we're supposed to be at 40 hours, the end. No discussion, no thought about what the consequences are to the farm workers or to the, to the employer. Um, <clears throat> when you have just a broad strokes approach like that, um, what you end up with is a <laughs> sort of the law of unintended consequences coming to fruition right between right in front of your eyes. And <clears throat> I think this, um, this particular growing season, we're going to see what that looks like. Uh, 55 hours is still a fairly long work week, but it is not the work week that our employees on farm are used to. So um, we have, there's a lot of suspicion about what is going to happen at 55 hours when employers have to send people home. And dairies are already seeing that because they're cut off at 40 hours. And at 40 hours, that's a regular work week. That's not a, that's not a, a work week where their employees are used to an additional 20 hours in that work week. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're cutting off a huge chunk of their income um, already. And, and they're seeing a rate of attrition that's fairly high. So, um, you know, we'll, I'll be checking that and tracking it so we can see what that really looks like, much like Oregon has legislated uh, with that economic impact study. Okay, I'm going to switch topics, switch gears just a little bit here. And um, this is on your other, um, your other blog, the EPA puts the woe in WOTUS. You know, that was another one where, first of all, I had to look up what WOTUS was, a little, a little bit of jargon there. Um, but it's basically a, a waterways management uh, 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 acronym for the federal government. And, um, and it's, it seems like, you know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Pam, but in summary, uh, what your blog is saying is um, the EPA wants to go back to uh, an, uh, redefining what, this, what the waterways management you know, system is supposed to look like and absorb far more waterways that are not navigable, that, um, that would enable them to control a lot more land. Coincidentally, a lot of that's rural and agricultural land and then uh, do what with it, you know, who knows? It uh, depends on what their whims are for, uh, for the, on, on the regulation department. But usually regulators love regulating more and more because that's, 
that's their uh, measure for success. They get into this zone where, you know, the more regulations they, they um, impart, uh, the more successful they are. And that can be a, a problematic way to measure success. Um, but, it, you know, one, is my assessment okay? And two, why don't you, why don't you put it in your own more educated words? Uh, yes, that's our, that's the general gist of it. So uh, WOTUS is the waters of the United States. Um, and what it really is, is sort of a definition of what constitutes the, the waters in the United States that the U.S. Department of Ecology governs and applies the rules of the Clean Water Act to. Um, Originally, the Clean Water Act was effectively supposed to be applied to rivers, lakes, and the ocean, as far as um, you know, the scope of what the United States operated in in the ocean. Um, and as, <clears throat> as administrations have come through, that scope has narrowed and widened for the waters of the US. In uh, 2015, that scope became extraordinarily broad. And WOTUS uh, was applied to quite literally every bit of existing water, whether it was permanent or ephemeral, meaning seasonal or uh, you know, the water that goes down the ditches on my farm for uh, a brief period of time every few weeks. And um, so there was a lot of challenges made to that definition of what constitutes the waters of the U.S. Um, because originally, waters of the U.S. had to be navigable. You had to be able to put a boat in it. I would argue my ditches that are approximately, let me see if I can figure out my camera. Here we go. My ditches are about that wide. Um, so you're not putting a boat that an actual person <laughs> can be on in a ditch that wide. Uh, you know, my kids have tiny boats that are you know, fun to play with, but a person is not gonna be on that boat. So um, <clears throat> the, AP, the EPA's scope for WOTUS was changed during the Trump administration to not be quite so broad and be a little bit more reasonable. It has been discussed to change it back to a much broader scope. Um, they are being encouraged to wait. There's a current court case, um, and it's called, it's Sackett versus uh, the Department of Ecology. And effectively, if you're in ag country, um, it's sort of a land grab um, on the part of the EPA to take as much as they can and control as much land as possible. Um, and all indicators are, that the EPA is not going to wait for the ruling of that court case. They're going to move ahead with this broader scoped version of the waters of the US. Um, for us in Washington state, we have a lot of water. Whether you are in Western Washington, where there is just a lot of water, or even here in the basin where technically we are a desert, but we are guaranteed uh, river water from Canada. So. Um, no matter where you are, WOTUS matters. And um, I think that the results of that ruling are certainly going to change how we have to look at the application of the Clean Water Act, um, particularly when it's coupled with the fact that the EPA is also trying to one up are state regulations for water because Washington has very strict water laws already and the EPA is trying to double down on them and make them even more strict already. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the enabling legislation to this was, was very focused on the navigable waterways, not drainage ditches, uh, uh, waterways that are open during the spring, but close the rest of the year, or you know, maybe part of the winter, but close the rest of the year. I mean, this, this is uh, one of those classic examples of, of you know, people reinterpreting something in such a fashion that it becomes something else entirely. So that the, you know, the difference is not just one of degree, but of principle, and it, and it becomes something separate. 
you know, and, and by the way, I, I think that general approach, I guess this is, you know, this is more me than WPC necessarily, but I think that um, it's, it doesn't encourage respect for the law because it avoids process and, and breeds anger and contempt, um, which is a, a, a bad thing as well. So it's, it's kind of a fascinating, you know, um, challenge. I'm not shocked to hear that there's a desire to go beyond the court date there. Um, and then one final comment, Pam, I have to say, as a, a, you know, since we're dealing with country and ag, having the lawsuit be, uh, deal with the Sacketts, um, since most country people know Louis L'Amour and the, and the, uh, the Sackett series, uh, that's kind of classic as well. A uh, little, little real life and a little nod to classic Western literature there. So, uh, yeah. Pam, yeah, I'm going to put you on, on hold while we turn to Mark Harmsworth. We'll come back to Pam. If you have any questions for her, you can uh, get those ready in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or at the side of your screen. And uh, we'll take questions for all center directors at the end. And don't forget, you can type them in at any time in the Q&A section there um, on, on your Zoom toolbox. We now turn to Mark Harmsworth, our Center for Small Business uh, Director, Mark, you had a blog about the Seattle rent moratorium finally coming to a close, and it had this ominous warning that, you know, yes, uh, the rental moratorium is coming to a close, but no, the you know the problems aren't uh, aren't going away with it. There's more problems ahead. Uh, what are they? Well, yeah, and we've seen over the last couple of years the moratorium. You know, there, there's some renters that were in definitely in, in dire straits, and, and it certainly helped a little bit there. But there were also a lot of renters that uh, took advantage of it. And for those of you who don't know, the monitoring basically said that the landlord can't collect rent from folks that are under duress because of the, the COVID situation. Uh, what we're now seeing, as we predicted a year ago, is a complete collapse of the rental market. In Seattle, 3,000 rental properties have disappeared. That's about 10,000 units. And they only added 27 new available units in March of this year. So you're seeing exactly what we predicted, which is property owners are looking at this as now a high risk environment because those property owners, I mean, a lot of rental owners, if you weren't aware, um, think about you, you buy your first home, maybe it's a little rambler, you do a fixer upper, and then you save some money and you buy a new house. And instead of selling your first house, you're able to rent it out as your rental. And then you end up in a situation like COVID where the state comes in and says, uh, 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 you can't collect any rent. And now you're facing two mortgage payments because you didn't pay that first house off. That was your retirement investment. Uh, we're not talking about, although this has certainly affected them, you know, large um, apartment dwellings and condo owners where they own a lot of condos and rent those out. You know, these are typically corporations and certainly they suffered financially as well. But, you know, the mom, mom and dad or, you know, the kids that were able to invest their money wisely and have themselves a little property to rent, uh, it's just not attractive anymore. And Seattle, because of the stuff that it's been doing, uh, has really, really screwed things up. They've jumped the shark, as they would say, on this, uh, on this rental market, because not only did they um, go through this whole moratorium, they're also uh, passing laws to make it even, or try, attempting to pass laws to make it even more difficult to be a landlord or a property owner. So House Bill 1904, which um, basically allows a uh, renter to uh, get out of their lease six months early. So uh, as you may have noticed, everything is getting much more expensive right now. Inflation uh, last numbers are over 10%, I think I've seen. And so uh, I would expect your rent to go up at the end of next year because the costs to maintain that property for a landowner, property owner uh, have gone up. So if the property owner plans on increasing your rent over 3%, they have to give you six month notice and then you get the ability to walk away from the property, walk away from your lease agreement at any point um, because they've done that. And if, and if they don't notify you, you can now sue them. And so it's a horrible situation uh, again, Seattle and a lot of uh, and the Washington state as well are passing laws and doing things that are literally, despite all the folks out there saying we need affordable housing, they're doing everything they can to make all the housing as not affordable as possible. When does that end, Mark? Uh, when we change the uh, city council or we have someone on there who knows how to run the property market. Um, what you need to do is reduce the amount of burdens um, on new construction 
and on remodeling. And I'm talking about permitting here. Uh, I, we wrote a blog and put it out on uh, some, just in Seattle specifically, some of the permitting fees. You know, it costs $287 to close the doors on a building just for an inspection. And that's, you're shutting the building down. The, there's 50 pages of different fees you have to pay when you're building something or doing something in Seattle. And you have to try and figure this out. It makes it incredibly expensive to maintain remodel, let's say you had a warehouse and, and you were had a project to maybe you're going to create some apartments or condos in there, incredibly expensive. And so the cost of that goes up. We have to streamline that, legislate, we have to streamline that, get rid of all of these fees, make it a lot simpler uh, for these folks to build and remodel homes to get that back on the market and then stop passing dumb laws like 19 or attempting to pass dumb laws like 1904 that create more restrictions for property owners because that way you'll encourage folks to come back into the market again. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of foreign investment where investors are buying up the houses right now. And it's a self-fulfilling prof prophecy because they'll buy the property knowing that they're reducing supply, which forces up the value of the property and that's their investment income. They don't even rent the properties, they just invest by buying these things. So we've got to get out of that cycle and the way you do that is to make it easier for people to rent, make it easier for property owners to rent those properties, and we make it easier to build new and remodel properties. If, um, you know, is this primarily a local problem? You know, because it seems, you know, the housing problem uh, has, seems to be very um, widespread. Um, even places in Eastern Washington, cities in Eastern Washington are complaining about the lack of housing within their, their boundaries. Um, so when you talk about creating these solutions, are you talking about a county solution, a city solution, a state solution, or does it have to be all of the above? And if it has to be all of the above, is there any realistic way that, you know, policymakers can, um, you know, would act on what's necessary uh, for something like this, uh, given, you know, given the, the realities of the times? Well, I think it is all the above, unfortunately. Uh, the state certainly has control over the moratorium that they put out that, you know, there's policies like that that shouldn't be in place. But individual jurisdictions also need to be paying attention to what they're doing. When they start passing laws that, um, and you think about Seattle specifically, you know, the, the tax on certain types of companies, Amazon employees, for example, or uh, they start restricting cars in and out of the city or they've got rampant crime and drugs on every corner and and it's a you know it's a complete mess people start leaving which is primarily seattle's biggest problem is people are leaving because they don't want to live in that kind of mess anymore um and that's also why these uh property owners are not renting this thing out so certainly local jurisdictions want to encourage and they can do that through zoning as well a municipality can zone different types of homes um, you know, when you look at the types of homes that are out there, uh, we have a lot of high density or mixed use residential that's going into a lot of municipalities, particularly around uh, corridors um, like 5, 4, 5, uh, and up here in Snohomish County, 527, 522, and the US2 Trasso in Lake Stevens. Um, but uh, we need to think very strategically about building infrastructure that supports that density if they're going to go down that road. And we need to have a mix of both single use, single homes and some of the apartments because most folks live in apartments for a period of their lives and then they want to raise a family or get a little more space to run the dog or whatever. And they want to buy a house. Whereas the, the uh, municipalities often are trying to zone just high density into specific areas. You end up with horrendous traffic, which then creates more of a problem, which then forces you to, live further and further out, which just make the problem even worse. So uh, a lot of the local zoning, a lot of the rules that don't seem connected to housing, certainly in Seattle, the crime is a problem. We've seen homelessness in other cities, which we need to deal with. Um, we need to have a holistic approach to that across the state um, as well. And that will certainly help reduce some of that. And, and take a look at the Growth Management Act, because that is definitely restricting uh, home building and the way that it is zoned uh, because we end up with these sort of urban clusters, which, again, restrict the type of housing and flexibility that people can see. We certainly need reform. Originally, it was put in place many years ago to stop urban sprawl like L.A., but it has not achieved that goal. Now we've got horrendous traffic as a result. 
switching gears just a little bit, Mark, um, and that this is on your uh, blog or column from a couple of weeks ago where you were talking about how state officials were pre um, were hitting uh, and fighting um, communities for failing to follow mask mandates and other things, but they were disproportionately doing it to rural communities. Um, how did you come up with the number and uh, are you standing by it? And uh, do you feel like there's, um, do you feel like that was by design or uh, uh, an, an accident of, of policy? Um, so as far as standing by the numbers, I don't really have to because they are their numbers. The, no, those numbers were sent to me by the Department of Revenue at LNI. So uh, it's literally a public records request, a spreadsheet they created for us and they sent it to us. So it's pretty easy to stand by unless they're calling themselves liars at this point. I, but I, I only ask because I enjoy the Facebook trolls and, and others that we get challenging such things. And, you know, I mean, the data, <laughs> it's the data from the government. So. Yeah, I mean, what would you like me to say, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you just need to look at it. It's just, it's a simple spreadsheet. We could probably even post it online. It's public, uh, it's public information anyway. And then you can, all, all the, all the, uh, the spreadsheet Excel geeks out there can start pivoting and doing all the stuff that they want to do with the data. Um, but the, the, the spreadsheet has two columns in it uh, specifically. One is uh, fines for COVID and then uh, it's fines for really, really bad COVID violations. So they sort of categorized them into two. And I was, I was very conservative in approach. I just picked off the really, really bad ones. I mean, the actual fines that they imposed, they never actually put on them or even higher still. So what you're, what you're seeing there is a, a breakdown of their pure data. All I did was literally order it by cities and pivot the data so I could see how much had been fined in each city. And the list that you see in the blog are literally that raw data just pivoted. So when you start looking at the types of things that they find folks for, you know, the entire Seattle area uh, was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars where we had one restaurant up in uh, Burlington, I think it was 2.1 million for one restaurant. Now, you know, they had some, uh, excuse me, it was a farm up in Burlington. It was a uh, uh, Longview was a restaurant, I think of 1.2 million. Um, but when you start looking at that, you can see that that was certainly a targeted uh, attack for all the businesses in Seattle. We're talking a couple of hundred thousand bucks, just under a couple of hundred thousand bucks for one business in Longview, 1.2 million. So it can show, it shows you there's so many more uh, places that could have gone in Seattle. Now, is Seattle that good at, and well, maybe it's because nobody's living there anymore and they all left because they can't find a rental unit anymore. But uh, with Seattle, uh, why didn't we see a larger number? I would have certainly expected to see at least a proportionally larger number on the number of fines. And then the other interesting one was Olympia because that's where Ellen is from. So I suspect that the l &I folks, when they're out for dinner at night, <laughs> they're seeing this type of stuff going on and, and that's why they get turned in. But the majority of the uh, fines were initiated by somebody either at the business, whether it was a patron, whether it was a customer, if it was a retail establishment or an, another type of business, whether it was an employee even, um, they were being turned into l &I, So it was the you know, rat on your neighbor uh, type of scenario that was going on that was driving those numbers. So do I think it was uh, targeted? I, I don't think there was any effort not to, let me put it that way. Yakima was heavily targeted because um, of its farming community. So there were certainly um, uh, industry segments that were targeted specifically. Construction was heavily targeted and that's in the spreadsheet. You can see that they've got these targeted plans and you can break those numbers out as well. I'm just picturing a farm being among the least, um, you know, as far as almost all the work is outdoors, you know, the mask mandate is going to be, um, the, you know, the least effective in, in such an environment by far. But Yeah. And, and then you pair that with the study we did last year about lockdowns and show how they were ineffective. And now we're starting to see that information come out of some of the larger institutions confirming the research that we did last year. It's the same the same type of thing it's uh is there talk at all of rescinding these kinds of heavy fines do you know mark or are they are these businesses stuck with them i mean it seems like you know now that there's been some time and on some of these mandates there's been um new science coming up saying well it looks like you know well i mean i know some people are gonna say that's not new but you know others are gonna say well look you know th there's there's less effectiveness here there seems to be some confusion among some who think that you know the vaccine 
uh, stops you from spreading COVID, when it's it prevents you know um, a, a worse case of it, but you can still carry it and spread it and, and so forth. So, um, is there any talk at all about alleviating some of these fines and and allowing people to kind of move on in a post COVID era? I I haven't heard any talk about it, but I would I would really hope as a gesture of goodwill that um, you know yeah. that we saw something like that. Uh, because these were through Illinois rulemaking. They weren't under statute. They were just under the executive order um, uh, rules that were put out by the governor's office. So I, I would hope so, um, at least for some of the smaller businesses that maybe had one or two violations. Um, but, I, you know, uh, it, it's frustrating that it got to this point um, that we that we're looking at fines for businesses for just trying to stay alive and and service their communities, both if they're a restaurant or retail, you know, and I'm not belittling um, COVID. It's, it's a, you know, it's a big issue, but uh, it, it seems ludicrous that the state would come in and, and enforce it in this manner. So I hope, I hope to see these, some relief for these businesses. Okay. I'm going to save room for just a couple of questions. I'm going to bring uh, Pam Lewison back and Elizabeth Hovde back, our Senator for um, the Initiative on Agriculture Director uh, and our Center for Healthcare Director, respectively, um, first question is uh, about the long-term care tax. You know, who does who does it harm? Um, who does this tax harm? And uh, isn't it small enough and provide an ample enough uh, benefit? You know, if we if we say that a, a great percentage of people actually need long-term care, if it's not really harming uh, uh, people in in any great measure, um, then is it really doing any bad thing? That's one of the hugest concerns, right? You're taking money away from even low income workers today for a benefit they may never need or use. And they're giving their money over to possibly a wealthy individual who does not need help with long-term care. So it's a very um, interesting law in that it's being sold as this compassionate thing when there's people barely able to make ends meet. And workers are having 58 cents of every hundred dollars go toward this fund. Thanks. Uh, next question. I think this one is uh, under your category, Mark. Um, foreign investment in properties. Are there any patterns in where the foreign investors are and or what type of investor, private individuals, companies, governments, et cetera, when it comes to these uh, purchases of rental properties? Um, it's pretty much all over. It's basically wherever you're seeing uh, real estate. And I've not done a huge amount of studying on all the different regions, but my anecdotal review of what I saw when I was looking at the Seattle market, um, uh, it's all over the US. It's not just here. It's where property's gone up in value. It's a lot of investment companies. Uh, some are foreign. Uh, some are domestic. Um, but uh, they're they're literally playing the market, which is exasperating, obviously, of house availability and rental availability. And this question's for you when it comes to the waterways of the United States and concern about Environmental Protection Agency overreach, what should the average person do to complain about uh, what, what looks to be a land grab by a federal agency? Um, so there's a couple things you can do right now. Um, the WOTUS review is still taking public comments. I believe public comments close May 1st. So there's a few more days to squeak in some public comment. Um, so that's always a good place to start. I think the other thing to do, honestly, is to uh, talk about it. You know, you have lawmakers, um, particularly your federal lawmakers, and explain to them, you know, what you believe the impacts are going to be to you as a person. Um, <clears throat> well, this is really complicated. Um, I have the benefit of having waded through a lot of water law uh, having worked in an irrigation district. So um, it is maybe less complicated for me just because I'm familiar with how water rights and those sorts of things work. But I think um, you know the, the biggest issue about WOTUS and the Clean Water Act and how it's applied is um, effectively, if you have standing water on your property, whether you are a farmer or um, you have a pond for goldfish in your backyard, um, depending on how broad the scope of the Clean Water Act and WOTUS are, this could have, you know, potentially affect you. Thanks, Pam. 
Uh, Follow-up question for Mark. Uh, could we get a bill that would limit some of the big multinational real estate investment funds from purchasing in our state or make it easier for our state developers to compete for those projects that we could write uh, to stem the sale of properties to out-of-state or communist nations? Yeah, I think you could. And if that came from a state legislature, I think they should get right on that. But um, uh, yeah, absolutely. You, you could, but I also you also have a free market issue here as well. You know, you got to be careful about limiting investment and, and, and that type of thing. So um, it would have to be very carefully crafted. Um, I mean, we, we typically deal with foreign investment, foreign income through tariffs, which I don't think the legislature could do. You'd have to do that at the federal level. Um, but uh, if what I would rather go after is the restrictions that some of the municipalities and the state has put on the, um, the rental market. Um, the House bill, like I said earlier, uh, do something inverse of that to make it, you still want to have rental protections and we have very strong rental laws already, but you, you also want to make sure that it's a, an attractive market that you want to invest in that increases supply. And if you're a demand supply type person, then you'll know that the rental costs will then stabilize if you do that. And in effect, and in addition, you'll see housing prices stabilize as well um, because of just availability. All right. Thanks, Mark. Well, I'm going to uh, wrap it up there. Uh, we, I do want to thank Mark Harmsworth, Pam Lewison, and Elizabeth Hovde, our center directors, for joining me today on Washington Policy on the Go. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. We hope that if you enjoyed the information, you valued the information that you got today, you'll invite friends uh, to also uh, sign up and register for Washington Policy on the Go, or you'll send them the video when we post it on, on chat, send them to our blog. Uh, because our center directors are updating the blog every day with the latest uh, policy information that you need to know. And it's a great news source for the information in the state of, uh, for, for the, the policies that are going to impact your life and what you can do about them. So thank you for attending. We hope we'll see you in two weeks and we hope that you'll become a member and encourage your friends and family to become members of Washington Policy Center. Thank you. <laughs>